quite Krishna with me, did he? <laughs> uh, fire side chat, but we don't have a fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the fire is in the hearts of all these devotees. True. Fire of devotion. True. Uh, been honored to be asked to ask you a few questions, if that's all right. Yes. As if she didn't know that ahead of time. <laughs> um, I think um, one thing that's probably on everybody's mind, uh, and I'll start with that. What is Gauravani really like? <laughs> <laughs> I think I was saying to somebody before we started that when I was raising him, I had to say the opposite of what I really wanted him to do. Like one of my friends, you know, you showed him Ayi from Gita Nagari? She was telling me, she says to her daughter, you know, I, I don't think you should really think about university. <laughs> It'd probably be a waste of time. <laughs> and so then her daughter comes back to her a little later. You know, Mama, University. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so I forbid you to chant 16 rounds, young man. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, should I share a story with my mom? Uh, yeah. Is it a quick one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe I forget it. I can tell you. No, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, we all so, know. So we used to have a store, and uh, we used to have three stores in the Washington area, and one, one Saturday I was at the store, and my husband called me up, and he said, uh, you better call your son, he, he needs to speak to you. And I, and I just, the first thing I thought was, great, Gauravani's in jail, and he's been busted for drugs, and that's the first thing I thought. So I called the number that the new team gave me, and Gora picks up, and he goes, Mata! I shaved my head and moved into the <laughs> How old was he? Oh, how old was he? At that time, I'm not sure, like maybe 18-ish or something okay. like that. Incredible. Wow. <laughs> so it's a day in the life of raising Gauravani. Yeah. <laughs> that could probably be a book at some point. But anyway, we'll get to that the devotee care thing. So on a more serious note, through your years in Krishna consciousness, which elements of care and association stand out to you as most important toward cultivating and maintaining healthy communities? Um, yeah, I would say, um, well, I, I'll, I'll quote what Raghunath Das Goswami says. Uh, step one is giving up pride. Yeah. You know, step one is giving up pride. and. Uh, Humility and gratitude, giving up pride, and then humility and gratitude. You know, not posturing that someone, you know, they're so learned, or, or because of position, or because of seniority, or because of the vast knowledge that they're carrying. Or, so giving up pride. Um, yeah, Raghunath Das Goswami, he has, he has something like, uh, what is his example? He says something like, carrying pride in your heart is like, is like having a, a dog-eating prostitute just dancing in your heart. <laughs> so um, it's a little graphic, but I think it really blocks us, you know. And and when we can cultivate uh, humility, and gratitude, then it, it just flips the whole thing. Um, yeah. I like how the three of those things really work in concert with each other, giving up pride. Yeah. Brings humility. Yeah. Gratitude brings humility. Yeah, the Archbishop of Canterbury once said that gratitude is a soil, like a type of dirt, that in which um, pride does not easily grow. Mm. Mm. So that's a very good quote. Mm. And Radna Swami said something beautiful also. He said, gratitude is the lobby to the palace of bhakti, and there is no back door. <laughs> so if you want bhakti, you, this is the way you have to go in. So, um, yeah, to be grateful for all the gifts we receive. And of course, pride just kills them, you know, like yeah. a sense of entitlement, actually. Just kills them. It's like a poisonous cancer in our hearts when we feel so entitled. And that's a, a big disease that I think Western people tend to carry. Mm -hmm. You know, when we grow up in this culture, the, you know, I'm so entitled to the American dream, and I, you know, I just pull myself up by my bootstraps. I don't need you, I don't need anyone. And it becomes like a cancer, that sense of entitlement. So, and I think we're all really all so vulnerable for that. So, with the end game, <coughs> excuse me, being cultivating and maintaining healthy communities, then it's like by, what, by 
working on an individual level like that, we have healthy individuals which in turn create a healthy community. Yeah, because we're, we're so eager to hear them. In that case, we would be so eager to hear from each other, to learn from each other. Like there's another nice gratitude quote from uh, the Bible, from Proverbs, where it says that someone with a grateful heart sits at a continuous feast. Mm -hmm. And I just imagine everyone's eager for the feast, right? So imagine sitting at a continuous feast of having a grateful heart. It's such a beautiful idea. And I wanted to share something also that, you know, because we're talking about living in community or acting in community here. So I think a really beautiful metaphor is that living in community or acting, serving in community, it's like being a river rock that's getting tumbled in the river. You know how river rocks are... River rocks are smooth and shiny, and the ones that are up isolated on the bank, Hari Bol, welcome, good to see you. The, the rocks that are up isolated on the bank are rough and scratchy because they're isolated, right? But when we're in community, you know, we get tossed by the flow of the river, and we get smoothed out, and we get uh, shined, and actually, you know, here I am with all my eclectic quotes, but Rumi said something really beautiful that he said, he said, um, if, if you are disturbed by every rub, how will your heart, how will your heart ever be polished? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how will your heart ever be polished if you're disturbed by every rub? Mm -hmm. So this image of living or serving in community, I don't know what's beeping, because I think I don't even have my phone here, but somehow my computer's beeping, sorry about that. But um, yeah, just this beautiful image, when I isolate, when I stay away, and I have all my conceptions, misconceptions, and all my, you know, he hates me, she hates me, I hate him, and all this kind of isolation consciousness, mm -hmm. then we're so rough, and we can really poke each other. But when we get tossed in the flow, we get smoothed out, we get shiny and beautiful. Great, well, it provides a nice segue this idea of being tossed about. So in cases of individual or community difficulties, was there anything that you've experienced or observed that was necessarily missing or overlooked? Yeah, you know, I, I want to be really straightforward here because I feel like um, when we discriminate in sectarian ways, we impoverish ourselves, impoverish ourselves, and we impoverish our communities. Like, for example, you know, I just really uh, wanted to say that when when the voices of the women are silenced, you know, then it just opens the door for children to be abused, for women themselves to be abused. So we impoverish ourselves when we silence any of the voices in our community. We need to hear from the women, or mostly mothers, who get it, you know. We need to hear from everyone. We need to hear from the youth. We need to hear from the elderly people. We need to hear from each other. We need to hear from people of all different cultures. And I feel like our strength is in our diversity, you know. Um, other communities, like there are other, um, you know, Hindu communities, and they'll be all South Indians, or all Gujaratis, or all this, or all that. Or, you know, and but our diversity is, is our strength. We have people from so many different perspectives and so many different cultures, and that's so enriching. You know, I get to hear from a Western single mom, growing, like the Bhakti Center class this morning. Somebody asked this beautiful question about, she said, um, I'm a black woman, I'm raising a daughter. How is my, my daughter's three years old? One day she's gonna be an adult black woman. How is she going to be protected in this culture? You know, I mean, that's our community. And so, you know, what what we can share. And Jamuna Jaya spoke such beautiful wisdom for her, but from her parents about how how her parents taught her. Well, she quoted Dr. Martin Luther King that um, you know I I look forward to a day when my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the quality of their hearts. You know, so this is what we have to share. It's so rich. It's so diverse. So I feel like, yeah, we impoverish our communities and we impoverish ourselves when we, oh, I'm so knowledgeable. I don't, I don't, I don't need to hear from you. I don't need to hear from you. We all need each other. Yes, great point. Yeah. It makes me think of when Kantabaki, my wife, was um, 
first coming around, and uh, we're at 26 Second Avenue, and that's one of the things that she commented on um, right off the bat was the diversity there and how appealing it was to her. She said, this is the real Rainbow Coalition. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. And uh, somehow she was able to hear from you. Because I remember- Despite hearing, hearing from me. When she, when she first met you, I remember hearing from you that the, your first impression was, please excuse me, this is embarrassing. When you first met him, you thought, I could take this guy in an argument any day. <laughs> then, Haven't won an argument since then. <laughs> Like a fungus. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rukmini, how can we continue to be progressive and personal in caring for devotees within our community? And as sort of a follow up, how to avoid stagnation or complacency? Okay, I want to share something that I like. This is a nice, I think this is a nice response to that question. Okay, this is something that was seen graffitied on a wall in Calcutta outside of one of Mother Teresa's convents. I don't know if any of you have heard, you might have heard this before, but I, I love this quite a lot. So this is in response to how can we... <clears throat> how can we continue to be progressive and personal? How can we continue to be progressive and personal? Here's, I think, a good answer. This person says, this anonymous person. So sometimes Mother Teresa is credited with this, but it wasn't actually written by Mother Teresa. So here's this, what this anonymous person says. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others may destroy overnight. Create anyway. If, if you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. And here's the, here's the real clincher, and I think this is really from a Bhakti perspective. This person says, be, give your best anyway, right? And then the, the final statement is, because in the end, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Mm. Isn't that good? Yeah. So. Very nice. Um, so any thoughts on how to avoid the, the, the stagnation? It's so easy to, to fall into complacency. Yeah, uh, caregivers burn out, right? Yeah. So uh, when we're caregivers, it's like breathing out, breathing out, breathing out, give and give and give, and there is a lot of burnout in those caregiving, in all caregiving fields. But we have, on our bhakti path, we have a solution for that. We have our spiritual, daily spiritual practice. So that's like breathing in, right? We're breathe, giving, 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 breathing out. We have to breathe in by having a daily practice of chanting. You know, whatever you've made a commitment to, don't make a promise you can't keep. But once you've made a promise, try to keep the promise, you know? So do your japa. You know, associate with devotees, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, take part in Kirtan, you know, this beautiful process, worship the beautiful Radha Murli Dara. And, oh my goodness, you know, they came to New York. The most beautiful Radha and Krishna. And what were there, like a thousand people here on Diwali? It was unbelievable. And the mayor, you know, came for darshan. So, isn't that amazing? Yeah, so I feel like the real answer is, as we, as we breathe out, as we give, we have to make sure to nourish ourselves. Otherwise, um, we, we can just, uh, you know, like a spark flying out of the fire can just go dark and cold. Gaur Kumar, what's your answer to that question? You know this from realization. What would you say? Uh, for me, it's uh, hearing, hearing lectures of senior devotees. That nourishes me, and that helps me to go on. 
data difference. So I agree with your answer very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I guess I would also say what I said in the beginning is um, get trained, you know, because there's expert guidance in these fields. So if you're feeling like, wow, this is a field I really like, it's spiritual care, you know, take one of those courses in training in uh, abuse, how to care for people who've been abused, or care and addiction, or grief training. I mean, they're looking for people to just partner, companion with people on these fields. Become a chaplain. You know, you can become a chaplain like Dina Bondu in a hospital or a university or even in the military. I mean, these are great fields for devotees where you're caring for people who are the most vulnerable and the most needy and the most often neglected, right? And what's more sacred than to help someone transition at the moment of death or in the moment of terrible grief, you know? So I would say um, those, are, um, those are some considerations. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Let's see, I think keeping, um, for people during the Civil Rights Movement used to have, they used to say, keep your eyes on the prize. You know, just keep your eyes on the prize. They could like go limp while being dragged off by the police with dogs biting at them, biting at their feet. And they would just go limp and be nonviolent and get dragged off to, to jail. So how were they doing They had this, this vision, so. Yeah, having the vision of the pole star. What is our goal in Krishna consciousness? That's so beautiful and so out of this world, you know. The lotus service to the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna. You know, like a eternal life in Krishna Loka playing with Nadi Krishna. These are the these are the prizes, right? So keep your eyes on the prize, keep your eyes on the goal and know what the rewards are that we have in store if we just keep on the path. I think those are Thank you. That's great. So as we look to the, toward the future, what are some areas of care that could benefit from deeper contemplation or more focused attention? Oh, um, I really wanted to share this beautiful story that Prabhupada told to our very own Adi Purusha. Um, he was in New Vrindavan, he was a new devotee, and he, Prabhupada <coughs> spoke to him on this idea of the future. So he... Um, I don't know if any of you, some of you might have heard this story before, but it's one of my really favorite Prabhupada stories. So he was doing this service. Prabhupada was there visiting New Vrindavan for three days, three or four days. And they had a rented house for Prabhupada. And Adi Purusha was, was the night guard. So he was standing outside guarding the house. And uh, he could hear Prabhupada on the dictaphone. He heard this clicking. He thought, oh, Prabhupada's reading his own book. And he realized Prabhupada was translating Krishna book. He was hearing Prabhupada speak and then click, click, click. And so then it started to rain. This is the long version. I hope you don't mind. But um, so then it started to rain a little bit. And so he went to do inside the attached garage to do his guarding from in there. So he went in there. And then he felt this presence behind him. And he turned around and there was Prabhupada right in the garage, right, right behind him. So he offered obeisances to Prabhupada. And he stood up and he said, Srila Prabhupada, just like any one of us who are, he said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, is there any service I can do for you? And Prabhupada, um, Prabhupada said, yes, you can go where I will not go. Mm -hmm. And he was really bewildered. Have you heard this one before? Yeah. He was, he was really bewildered because Prabhupada had just come from Tokyo, from California, from Texas, from <laughs> Chicago, from Atlanta. Now he's in New Vrindavan and he's going to New York, from London and Paris, which are Right? And so he was bewildered, and he said, but, but Prabhupada, you go everywhere. Where is it that you won't go? And Prabhupada goes, he said, to the future. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said, and by the way you treat the people there, they will know how much Krishna loves them. So I think that's you know, one of the most important Prabhupada stories that I've ever heard. You know? And I, I think it really speaks to spiritual care. Go to the future, and you know you're all people of the future, right? You know you're going off to the future when you leave here today. That's a future. So by the way you treat the people, by the way you notice, I mentioned before radical noticing. You know you notice that some maybe you're going into a kirtan. There's going to be a really fun, beautiful Thursday night kirtan. But you notice somebody who's sitting on the stairs, kind of moping by themselves. Like 
notice, you know, what's wrong? Is there something you want to talk? You know, is there anything you'd like to, sh you know, just radical noticing, radical personalism, and that's uh, that will change the, the future, I think. Mm -hmm. That changes the whole, to me, that changes the whole trajectory of, of what we're trying to do at the Bhakti Center. This is the Bhakti Center, we're trying to create beloved community here. That's uh, very, very sacred. That's what Martin Luther King talked about. So that's a, a very, very important uh, goal for change of consciousness, change of culture here in New York City and the world. So, um, yeah. yeah. Go to the future. By the way, you treat the people there, they will know how much Krishna loves them. And sometimes it's very one on one. Yeah. You know, sometimes. You know, sometimes just by noticing someone like that, you can help them avert a suicide. You know, sometimes that, you know, I mean, it's just amazing. Just noticing, just taking the time to, to reach out or spend a moment. And, you know, you may, have, you may all be thinking of incidents like that where you see things like that. You, know, you notice the change, the trajectory of someone's life. You never know what someone's going through. Yeah. yeah. As aspiring devotees, which aspects of our lives and journeys require ongoing introspection and contemplation? What is the relationship between personal well-being or growth and our ability to care for others? Yeah, I think, I think it's the same thing. I think that we can only be empowered to to give and to breathe out if we're breathing in, if we're nourishing ourselves, then we walk out each day with a, you know, with, we're fortified, you know. So, but was that Wheaties or something? Wheaties. Wheaties. It's like better than Wheaties or Cheerios. You know, you're totally fortified having them. And so that's, you know, that's the magic of what Prabhupada's given us. You know, it's a, you know, he really, codified and condensed the teachings of Rupa Goswami, these five things that are part of our program, you know, to study Srimad Bhagavatam, associate with devotees, chant the holy name, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, worship the deities, you know, it's so powerful. So all that to me is like fortifying ourselves to be able to to give. And 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 when we don't aren't doing those things, I think our giving becomes a little bit hollow maybe. It becomes you know, it, become, it can become like a shadow of giving, you know, or just a, you know, more, something more hollow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, that's always a danger. So we have to be authentic. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be authentic and heart changing because devotees are supposed to be like, like fire. They're supposed to be able to ignite other people's hearts. There's this beautiful quote from Prabhupada's Guru Srila Bhakti Siddhanta where he says, he says, a real guru does not make disciples. A real guru makes other gurus. And then he goes on from there, you know? A real guru is not making disciples, but making other gurus. So it's supposed to be, you know, your heart's on fire, you touch someone, that their heart is on fire, and that person's on fire. And in that way, the whole world can become ignited with beautiful, uh, fiery, Beautiful, blazing, effulgent bhakti. How world changing it is. Lovely, yeah. Um, you've addressed this already today, but I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to say about it. In the realm of spiritual care, we often hear about the significance of presence. Mm -hmm. So, what does it mean to truly be present for someone? Yeah, presence. It's such a such a beautiful concept and a beautiful word. And, in one sense, it could be, um, you know, we could think of it in, in kind of an impersonal way. Presence, it's, it's beautiful and it sounds mystical, but it, but it kind of can sound a little bit vague also. But I think on the path of bhakti, um, presence, it's imminently personal, you know, because we're talking about not just presence, we're talking about his presence. You know, we're talking about being in Krishna's presence. and. Um, you know, like uh, being in Krishna's presence, being in Prabhupada's presence, or whoever your guru might be that inspires you. You know, you sometimes might say to yourself when you're in a jam or a predicament, well, you know, I know the Christians say that, but what would Jesus do right now, right? So I think that's really important. Well, what would Radhana Swami do right now? 
what would Srila Prabhupada do or say in this very moment? And, and um, so I think it's presence is about knowing that you're in Krishna's presence at every moment. You're in the presence of that beautiful guru who inspires you. And I was thinking of this verse from the Gita 630, for one who sees me everywhere and sees everyone in me, I am never lost to him, nor is he ever lost to me. Or this one, just a few verses later, he is a perfect yogi who by comparison to his own self sees the true equality of all beings in both their happiness and their distress, O Arjuna. So uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's eminently personal. And I was thinking about this story I just heard a few days ago about Gorka Shardas Babaji I don't know if you've heard this one. But he would, he was very, very renounced and he would just be chanting and doing his bhajan in crazy places like right by a latrine so that materialistic people wouldn't bother him. Anyway, so he went to, off into the forest uh, one day to follow his nature's call, as they say in India. And um, some boys were throwing rocks at him. And, and so, because he's in this mood of presence, he's feeling like he's in Krishna's presence at every moment. So he said to these, these boys, these mischievous boys who were throwing rocks at him, he said, Krishna, you have to stop throwing rocks at me, otherwise I'm going to tell Mother Yasoda on you. <laughs> so, can you imagine the consciousness, you know? Boys, I mean, like, think of, like, the vast difference between my consciousness and that consciousness, you know? But, yeah, he's, he's just seeing Krishna. It reminds me of that, that quote I, I mentioned earlier, the Prabhupada said, everything is moving, acting under the supreme desire of Krishna. This consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. So to be in presence, to, to really have a sense that whatever I'm going through is, I can turn to Krishna or somehow it's happening by Krishna's will and, and that dear most trusted friend is sitting right in my heart that I can turn to for, for advice or for, you know, to hear me, to advise me, to help me. Um, there is some nice, Four Principles of Community Building by Bhakti Jitha Maharaj. You want to hear these? I do. Okay. These are good. He was a great community builder. Very broad-minded, out of the box. Um, people used to, when he was around in those days, people used to deris der derisively call him the love guru. You know, like put him down, like, oh, you know, you're just all about love. You're so sentimental. But he actually was really getting it. So here's what he says about community building. So number one, he says, treat everyone as if the success of your spiritual life depends on the quality of your interactions with them. Okay? Number two, reflect on the person you love the most and aspire to treat everyone with that same quality of love. You know, so it's not, you know, sometimes in ISKCON people are just like jumping over the devotees to give the garland to their guru. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you guys get out of my way, I got my guru here, you know. But no, treating everyone with that same kind of love, right? And then number three, view all conflicts as your own fault first and a chance for growth <clears throat> to clarify perceptions and create synergy. So that's a very um, powerful humility. To see, well, what, what have I done maybe to contribute to the problem? And then the fourth one is this is very poignant, I think. He says, realize that the people in your present environment may be those with whom you'll live out your life and be with you at the time of your death. So, yeah, you know, look around the room. Mm -hmm. These are the people that you're going to call or somebody's going to call when you're on your deathbed, you know, who are going to come and help you remember to chant Krishna's holy name. So, you know, worship these relationships. It's really powerful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we accommodate people of many different backgrounds? You've spoken about the diversity. So how can we accommodate people of many different backgrounds, natures, we all have a different nature, and level, levels of involvement within the community? So all of these things are at play. The backgrounds, individual natures, the level of involvement, and how can we aspire toward engagement, connection, and collective happiness? Yeah, you know, I think the real answer to that question is we have to really be off the bodily platform. We have to be beyond the, the ego platform 
to really uh, be able to see the value and the diversity in our communities. We have one devotee, wonderful, sweet devotee in our community in Potomac, Washington, D.C. She's from Rwanda. She, I mean, who can imagine the suffering she's been through her personal history? Mm -hmm. And uh, so she's African Rwandan, and uh, some person from, um, I won't mention what culture, but somebody from another culture came to her temple and said to her, what are you doing here? This is not your religion, you know? Mm. She just felt so uh, unwanted, displaced, unseen, ignored. Actually, she's a beautiful devotee, but somebody who was thinking, and, and not that most devotees or many devotees even think like that, but somehow this person was thinking in a sectarian way, what are you doing here? This is not for you. Go back where you came from. You know, so we have to be, really we have to give up the bodily conception of life. We were just talking on Radha Bhakti and I, well, I think it was you, we were talking right before this, the session started this morning that, um, you know, that, that these problems in the world are, that are just stemming from so much hate, they're rooted in the bodily conception of life. I mean, really, Prabhupada gave the answers, so if we can, reach out to people in an authentic way, this can be so world-changing. You know, people suffering so much because of hate and prejudice and sectarianism and inherited prejudices and, you know, um, yeah, you know, look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, the way they could be so authentic and show up in such authentic ways. So these um, changes of heart are so culture changing, world changing. Yeah. It's so shocking that someone in this Khan temple could make a statement like that, mm -hmm. which it seems like you know 101 of what Prabhupada gave us. Yeah. Yet it's a, there's a lesson there that just because we get the information and we think we understand it intellectually doesn't mean we get the information mm -hmm. right. and assimilate it into our lives. Right, right, right. So how to, um, you know, how to be kind to the person who really doesn't get it and to help that person come along to a deeper understanding and how can we learn from our mistakes, others' mistakes, all the sectarianism, prejudice, <clears throat> and hate. The same thing could be said for whoever doesn't want to hear a woman's voice. Yeah. So, you know, what yeah. are you missing here? Yeah, and I feel like, um, you know, sometimes it's people taking a story out of Chaitanya Charitamrita, like Lord Chaitanya not wanting to hear a woman singing, right? His, his servant caught him. He was about to run and embrace this woman who was singing Gita Govinda so beautifully. So you take a story like that and, and you know, transpose it onto 2023 New York. And that, that just doesn't work. You know, there's a story from a few years ago, it was maybe in the um, 1970s, Somebody, some uh, young person who thought he knew so much wrote to Prabhupada and said, well, why are we listening to Yamuna Devi leading this, go, this Govindam prayers in the morning? You know, why are we listening to a woman sing? We should be listening to you, Prabhupada. You know, he was making a very over, Prabhupada used to use this term, over-intelligent. He was making an over-intelligent suggestion to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was really furious. He said, oh, you have to, he wrote back, you know, oh, you have discovered something. He said, actually, this is a great concert of Krishna consciousness that I am enjoying every day listening to. You know? So, um, you know, we can carry so much prejudice, sectarianism, um, but we have so much to learn from. I think we have so much to learn from the other. You know, and, and, and how bhakti, the real bhakti culture shows up, and it's not the same as, um, you know, traditional, materialistic Indian culture or Western culture or anything. It's a bhakti culture, and it's, it's head and shoulders above those materialistic cultures of whatever we come from, Western feminism or Indian tradition. It's a bhakti culture, which means really seeing the the self, and, and this is Prabhupada's thinking. You know, whatever any, you know, Prabhupada, when he came to the West, he didn't really think that women were gonna be coming and joining his Krishna consciousness movement, and that wasn't really happening in India. But when we did, he just gave us full facility. Whatever you wanna do, whatever you're inspired to do, do it, you know? Maybe you've heard me tell that story of when Prabhupada was 
26 Second Avenue, Prabhupada is looking into each one of our faces up in his apartment behind the temple. I want each one of you to open a temple somewhere. Mm. You know, I was 16 years old. I said, even the girls, <laughs> even the girls, Swamiji, you know, he was laughing. You know, he said, yes, there's no difference between the boys and the girls, you know. And then he started talking about Janava Devi. How she was the you know most esteemed head of the whole district of succession, leading the whole mission of Krishna consciousness. So he he was very broad in his thinking. And, um, so I think we again we impoverish ourselves, we impoverish our, our our temples and our communities when we try to exclude others that may have tremendous gifts. I'll tell you another funny story. So there's one very senior brahmachari, very respected senior brahmachari a god brother of many of yours. And he was visiting the Chicago temple. There's a new temple coming up in Naperville, which is a, a suburb, or you're from Chicago, yeah. is a suburb of Chicago where there are a lot of affluent Indian people moving out to that area. And so they're building this new temple there. And this very senior brahmachari was saying to my husband, saying, he was amazed that there's a woman temple president there. And he was amazed that she could get this together, to pull off this construction. <laughs> he was like scratching his head. How was a woman pulling this off? And you know, so my husband, Anutama Prabhu, who's very progressive on you know um, helping women um, come be in positions of whatever, whatever they can do. So he said, Yeah, you know, we give women a chance here. <laughs> we keep trying to tell you guys they can do wonderful things and you give them a chance. Yeah. You know, he was very surprised. Oh wow, you know, maybe we should try that. Meanie Devi, thank you as <clears throat> as a woman and as a devotee for pioneering um, yes. the way. Contribution is, uh, you, you can't underestimate it because you really, um, it's, it's a contribution that you might not get credit for historically, but it's historic. Mm -hmm. What you've enabled the rest of us in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. I don't know that we have time for questions, do we? So what we'll do is actually, what time is it right now? It's got, yeah, it's yeah. No, So what we'll do is we'll go, this is so wonderful. We don't want to truncate this okay. in any way. So what we'll do is we'll continue until 12.30, RT. We'll all go for RT. After RT is lunch. And then after lunch, we'll start with Yadanath Prabhu refreshing us with some comedy, some <laughs> sweet, you know, humor. And then, yeah, trust me, fingers crossed. And then that, you know, after after that will happen, then we'll enter into our informed section of the program, where we'll have some presentations from each of the individual care initiatives, so that we can understand more deeply. And that will be the plan. But let's leave as much time for Q and A as we can. Good. Okay. Are there any cues that uh, let me yeah. can A? <laughs> yes. yes. There's the future right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll just be honest personally with something I'm struggling with. In terms of community care, I find sometimes, um, recently I found that I've, I've given and given and given so much. And Krishna revealed to me that I didn't realize I was expecting something in return. Oh. And um, in, in the sense of like, I've been giving and giving, and I feel almost depleted that like, I haven't, I haven't, I don't feel so cared for. And I, I hate to say that because I don't want to like make anyone in the room feel bad because I know everyone, I know the devotees do care for me. But I almost feel like maybe I've overextended or something. Or just I've been in times when I feel like, where's, where, where is anyone to, to be there for me when like I would be there for others that I know were in my position? Mm -hmm. And then I realize like that's that's an anarta in me of like wanting to receive care. So like. 
how do how do we remove that? I'm specifically asking you because I've heard you speak on several occasions about the disease of entitlement, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that actually. Mm -hmm. And I realize like I feel entitled to be cared for in the way that I feel I should care for other devotees. Like. So how can I continue on caring for others in the way that I want to be cared for without expecting them to care for me mm. like that? In thank return? you for thank you for the very vulnerable question. You know, so you know I think it may be well. It's us. It said um, give more, appreciate more, expect less and live frugally on surprise. So um, personally, when I wake up in the morning, one of the things I pray is, please bless me um, with radical noticing. Let me notice um, something that I, that I had taken, been taking for granted, you know? But the real answer, I think, is that I think what you're experiencing is part of the terrain of being a new mother, actually. You know, because when you're a new mom, you know, you're just, by, by part, being part of the, that relationship, you're isolated and you're on call 24-7. You know, there's no days off, there's no overtime pay, there's no, there's no, you know. So I think part of it is just realizing that goes with the terrain of being a new mom and just keep your eyes on the pole star and keep your eyes on the prize of that long-term vision of you know, what you're trying to receive in this Krishna consciousness and what you're trying to give your daughter. You know, so they, they really grow up really fast. And, you know, for someone who's been there and you, know, feel, you feel isolated, and you know, there's the diapers and it's all night and you know, no sleep and all, on and on and on. So it kind of goes with the terrain. But she's growing up really fast and she's, <laughs> upside down and she's, you know, she's even when she's upside down she's she's hearing everything she's copying everything she's learning to repeat everything um, you know so so just try to do what you can and self-compassion you know self-compassion because you may not be able to make it to the Thursday night kirtan or whatever kirtan you want to make it to or whatever you know special wonderful class that happens at Bhakti Center but be kind to yourself understand that you know many mothers in past ages have gone through this as well and that um, you know that will be a great result for all your you're giving um, try to try to receive as much as you can but be kind to yourself when you're not able to receive more and, you know you're in a very giving place now being a mom yeah. it's not easy but I would say I, I think I felt like that even before I became a mom mm -hmm. like yeah. So, and I asked the question because I was hoping it would benefit other people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, so, you know, that, that little mantra of, of uh, appreciate more, expect less, and live frugally on surprise. Surprise is, like, pray to be surprised by Krishna's wonder, wonderfulness. You know, a little, you know, like, in small or big ways, right? Um, there's a nice story that I like about Socrates, that he used to like to go to the market, and even though he was very frugal, he didn't like to buy anything. And his students, one of his students asked him, well, why do you like to go to the market? You never buy anything. And he said, I like to go and see all the things I don't need. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, just like live frugally on surprise and appreciate more, like pray for opportunities to appreciate. Because so many things were just so, um, you know, we're so conditioned to just, I've seen that. You know how babies can appreciate, like little two-year-olds, three-year-olds, like they're crumpling the leaves under their boot or in the autumn or smashing an ice puddle or, you know, like seeing a bug. Wow! <laughs> you know? But adults, oh, I've seen that a hundred times. I've seen, you know, every time I listen to a Christian story, I heard that story a hundred times. You know? So we're so jaded and we're so... Um, yeah, we're so jaded and so um, so dull. So pray for those opportunities to appreciate more, expect less, and um, be um, live frugally on surprise.
Thank you again for your courage, Tosi Yeah. Morris, the moms, they're building a teacher. Moms, key job. Moms, key job. Other questions? Yes. Oh, Adam, oh, may I may I just add something, if that's okay? Yeah. Um, I've uh, I've spoken a lot to and listened a lot to um, many senior devotees about comparable topics and questions and a couple things that have helped me is number one um, and please let me know if this is okay to say about the Jeep, but um, it's okay to have expectations and, and to feel like we shouldn't have expectations is like not human um, but maybe it's like finding those two or three people whose default behavior matches our expectations and we give so deeply to them and receive from them as well and from them it's okay to expect and then also keep giving and it will come in ways that maybe you're not like maybe you expect from this person but it comes from that person but we're hung up on why does and so if we want everybody to reciprocate in the same way that we would give then what makes us special so that's something else that really inspired me I don't mean to make this about you because I know it's about all of us, but I've just asked similar questions very often. I felt the same way. And that really helps me. Like, who are those two to three people that it's okay to expect from, it's okay to feel like human with and upset with? And then where can I just keep giving and, and just be receptive to where reciprocation is coming where I'm not expecting it from, if that makes sense. Is that okay? Yeah, very good. But I think it's um, kind of relevant to all of us as, you know, caregivers. And, you know, you were talking about how, um, you know, radical listening or deep listening is so important. And um, what I've noticed, at least for me, and this is my fault, but um, is that I can kind of get derailed by deep listening where, you know, I'm, I'm giving so much, I'm listening so much that there comes a point where like you're kind of stuck in this mode like you have to pull yourself out of it I'm trying to assist you pull out of it so I move from mm -hmm. you know walking the sides to walking in front mm -hmm. and um, so that transi transition can kind of be a little you know hard to navigate at times with people and I find that it can be a little bit rough in that you know that process like okay you know what you've grieved, you've, you know, I've listened to you, I've given, I've supported, I've walked along, but now it's time for you to move out of this mode and I need to assist you. Can you give us some pointers in terms of how to make that transition? Because I, I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, that's, you know, that's, I would say that's a tough one because sometimes people are just not moving on and are quite stuck and they want to just kind of keep in that stuck place, um, you know, but sometimes um, just making a shift in the relationship helps. Sometimes silence helps, or maybe a change of scenery, or a change of mode, or um, just making a shift so it's not just you hearing, 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 and then going on and on and on. Um, I, I would say, like, change it up somehow, um, either with silence or a change of the relationship or suggesting um, you know maybe another maybe there's another person that they could be hearing from or speaking to and sometimes with um, I don't know if you're talking about grief but with complicated grief sometimes this uh, Dr. Alan Wolf really talks about it, but sometimes someone needs really needs professional help because it's not just within the boundaries of a grief support group or even a one-on-one -on -one grief support. Sometimes people really need professional help. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people even need medication. You know? um, and I want to ask you, because you're a professional in this field, what, so the question is when someone's stuck and you're doing deep listening, deep listening, deep listening, but you feel like they're just, is this what you're saying? Or that you feel like they're just, it keeps circling around in that same place. And you know, you're just given everything you can and they're not really moving forward. So as a professional, 
chaplain, what would you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes it has to do with being extremely attentive to the details and the little intricacies of the way that they're living their lives because there usually is some measurable kind of progress there. And it's not that we even want to frame it in that way for them. It's almost an affirmation of like, look at you, you're still existing, you're still here, you're still in the process. And usually there is some, pro some progress there, not that we overemphasize that because it becomes a pressurized thing. But a lot of it has to do with being extremely attentive to detail and getting to know the person on a very deep level. So you can say, I noticed that you're smiling more easily today. Something like that, something small, but it's not small, it's big. So in that sense, we have the opportunity to really be with someone in their growth and also not to, not to pressurize the process. Of course, as Rukmini Prabhu said, there may be a need for professional help. There may be a time where we have to, as Radha Bhakti was saying, give like loving feedback and accountability about someone's process. But at the same time, as long as they're safe, um, it's a question of, you know, their own pace, their own process, and noticing little moments of, of encouragement, noticing little things about, that are beautiful in that person. Wow, you, when you shared just now, when you were crying, you're so comfortable with being honest about, you know, like things like that. So usually we can find these points of encouragement that remind the person of their own beauty and their own aliveness. Beautiful. That's really important. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And I think that's our signal. One more time for Ruth Mead. So we'll, so we'll all follow Dial Garanga Prabhu, who will be chanting afternoon kirtan.